It's waiting for the little line to go across the street. Okay, you're ready to go then, Robin. Thank you. Okay, um, so, I'm, so I'm Robin Tugut. I'm chairman of an organisation called Orchard Link, which is a South Devon um, not-for-profit organisation set up by Orchard and Apple enthusiasts. And I'll say more about Orchard Link a bit later, but this is a picture of me in the orchard that I part own with some other neighbours in South Brent where I live. And I'm just raking up the hay. And um, we've had this orchard for about 15 years or something like that. So I, I'm interested in orchards and apples from all different directions. Um, put my name on it. So one of the things I've got to get used to, there we go. <laughs> I think okay we've got somebody needing muting there. I've, um, I've done that okay thank you um so I'm going to jump in with both feet with a history of orchards and cider making in South Devon with a heyday so what was it like at its maximum so there were basically six main counties, which were the orchard and cider counties of England. So that's Hereford, Worcester, Gloucestershire, Kent, Somerset, and Devon. And Devon was the, had the biggest acreage of all of them. Um, it was a really important feature of the South Devon landscape. And um, so uh, this picture here on the screen is a cider orchard in South Devon, um, taken early in the 20th century. You can tell it's a cider apple orchard because the apples are on the ground. If it was dessert apples, obviously they'd have to be hand-picked without being bruised. But with cider apples, they tend to be shaken down or left to drop. They're going to go straight in the bar to be crushed and pressed and put into the cider barrels so it doesn't matter if they all fall on the ground and get a little bit bruised. So the so sometimes South, the South Hams was known or Devon was known as the cider capital of England and um, one of these early writers travellers from the 1790s Robert Fraser wrote about South Devon and particularly the South Hams um, with this picture of, of, of villages with uh, in the middle of orchards. So every, every village had its little clothing of orchards around it. This is actually at Batson and the, with all the fruit trees in flower. Um, but to give you an idea of just what a big impact that had on our landscape, if you look at the early ordnance survey maps for any of our villages in South Devon, you'll see that they look like this, most of them. This is Compton, Ipplepen and Malden, a little cluster of three villages. Um, and they can see in the picture, they've all got tight um, pack, like a framing of orchards around the core of the villages. And that was repeated across village after village after village of the South Hams. And it was a really characteristic part of our landscape. Um, the, the, development, the, the, the development of orchards had a sort of slow burn, really, in this country. They, it was thought that apples first came over with the Romans, and then the Normans gave it a big push. But uh, often the early development took place in monasteries and royal courts. And it was only much later, it went, Henry VIII was, was the one who got systematic about apples and orchards and developing the best strains, the best varieties. And he appointed a royal um, orchard, or an orchard, I don't know what you'd call him really, whose job was to go all around Europe scouting for the best makes of the best varieties of apples and setting up mother orchards in Kent. So it was really the 16th and 17th century that things really started spreading with a heyday in the 18th and 19th century. But in South Devon, um, it's really important to know that, that orchards and cider were a mainstream part of the farm economy. Every farm had them. Um, it was what everybody drank and it was a crop that got sold if there was any spare.
it was so ubiquitous, I suppose you could say, that um, it was part of the currency. So if you were an agricultural labourer, you would get an entitlement of cider every day. And as it says here, you get a, a quarter of a quart of cider was part of your daily wage as an agricultural labourer. And it says here with as much cider as they choose to drink. So this was 1794 was that was that comment the photo is a much later one was uh, was taken in south devon on a farm in the 1920s or 1930s um, one of the things you notice is just how many people are involved in the apple harvest these photos were lovely to find i got them from the totnes image bank and if any of you are curious to look at lovely old historic photos of the rural landscape do do put uh, Totnes Image Bank into your search engine and have a look at the photos there. The Cookworthy Museum at Kingsbridge has got a fabulous collection as well, but there's not so many of them online as there are with the Totnes Image Bank, or at least not last time I looked, but well worth a visit. So uh, onwards. It was also had a downside, this, in, the, the sheer amount of um, cider that was being drunk. And this um, rather prim and proper William Marshall looking at the rural economy of the West of England in the late 1700, 1700s commented on this drunkenness and dissoluteness of manners due to the baleful, baleful effects of cider. So there was a downside to it as well. Um, this, uh, no, I'm going to go on to my next picture. One of the results of, of this long heritage of Devon apple growing was that we developed a lot of our own unique local varieties. And there's lots of them. This is just a short selection of some of them. So we developed a whole um, heritage of varieties um, which are distinct and special to our area. And if you're interested in finding out more, there's a rather nice little website which I've listed at the, uh, underneath the title there, um, which is um, www.devon-apples.co.uk. And that gives a listing of all the Devon apple varieties and other fruits as well. It's really good to visit. And, um, and with a description and what the kind of apples, what kind of taste, what use they have, and any particular characteristics. So there's some good information around if you're interested. It's a bit of a detective um, expedition, really, to find out more and more. The technology was pretty much unchanged for a long time, for some centuries, really. The idea of these manually or horse operated presses, which no crushers, which crush the apples. And then these big um, presses with these huge steel screw threads um, and great bulks of timber. Um, they're still to be seen in some barns, and some of them are still in use. There's um, a cider maker up in the Teen Valley at Brimblecombe Farm who still uses one of these giant presses with the layers of apple pulp squashed between um, layers of straw. And I, we went up and joined in with them doing the, <clears throat> doing the apple pressing there a few years ago. So this technology is still around. And it meant that mostly uh, orchards and cider making operated as a sort of cottage economy. Um, where every farm and barn would have their own apple crushers and apple presses. Things began to change um, with the coming of the canals up country, but particularly the railways in the 19th century, because this meant that cider makers and apple producers could export their apples to a much bigger market. And if we look at one example, so Henley's at Abbott's Kurzweil, that's just south of Newton Abbott, 
That was a little family firm that started off in 1791. And they did well. They used the apples from 50 orchards in the immediate vicinity. But they were good businessmen and they grew the business and they expanded the site. And in 1933, they sold out to a bigger company called White Waves. And this picture here that on, the, on the screen, in the top right, it shows the, um, the mills at Abbott's Curswell at the, at the, um, uh, where they brewed the cider, which had become quite a large industrial process. Some of their vats held 60,000 gallons of cider. And they were able to open their own siding at the railway at Newton Abbott and transfer their uh, depot there and export up to London. So in the era of White Wave Cider, they had, um, they had a depot in London and they had shops in Totnes and Kingsbridge and Ashburton. So it was a much bigger operation. And in the picture, you can see the tankers in the bottom right. You can see the railway in the middle right. And this rather lovely advert in the top left for White Wave Cider. And I don't know if you can make it out. The train starts off its journey in a distance with the apples, and then they turn into bottles, and then they turn into railway carriages, and off they go. And it's the Health Express from Devonshire. So interesting that one of the selling propositions for Devon Cider was its benefit as a, for health. And the bottom left was the original Henley's True Devon Cider pub sign. So that was, um, that grew and grew and grew throughout the 20th century, but then things started getting rocky and this site at um, Abbott's Curswell closed in 1965. So there we have a run through of the heyday and the growth of this industry where Devon cider was being exported all over the UK and all over Europe and the USA and the Middle East as well. Uh, it had a, an international reach at its peak in the early 20th century. But then came the big crash. So what caused the, um, this amazing industry, which had grown to be so successful, what caused it to collapse in the way that it has done? There were many causes. Let's start off with the farm side. In these old photos I found of um, farm life with people out working in the fields or picking the apples, the thing that strikes you most is just how many people worked the land. There were lots of them. And managing orchards was a labor intensive job, not only the harvesting, but the, um, and, and the pressing and the making of the cider and the pruning and everything. So it needed lots of people. And of course, after two world wars and the Great Depression and all the upheavals, there were far fewer people working the land. And if you look at the bottom right, the solitary tractor is the only thing moving in that landscape pretty much. Farming is now quite a solitary job for a lot of people. There are no longer lots of people. And so a lot of the labor intensive farming practices disappeared, including a lot of orchards. And in the post-war period, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, farmers could get grants from the Ministry of Agriculture for grubbing up their orchards, because the orchards were seen as unprofitable, prone to canker and scab and kind of in the way when there was more money to be made from arable crops or livestock. So a huge amount of the um, of, of orchards were grubbed up in the name of agricultural improvement. 
And it's worth reflecting the difference between a traditional Devon orchard and a modern one. So the traditional orchard, you might say, which was so characteristic of our area, had these very large trees, those rootstocks, about 40 per acre. They weren't that productive and they were very variable. Some years you might only get a couple of tons an acre, some years much more, but they were very low input. Often they were mixed with other kinds of farming. So here we've got sheep, but they might be grazed by cattle or geese. Um, they tended not to be sprayed very much and they were pretty low intensive. Low input, low output was the picture. These were, became inherently uneconomic in the, in the late 20th century um, and, and ma mass production. And so the technology of orchard ownership and management changed a lot. And if we contrast this characteristic traditional Devon orchard with a modern one, it's a very different picture indeed. So, First of all, the trees are much more densely planted with smaller rootstocks, so semi-dwarfing rootstocks. They be much more regular in their cropping and getting much higher tonnages per acre. And there'd be much higher inputs of pruning, mowing and spraying. And they tend not to be grazed either. So it's a much more intensive monoculture type crop. And when I say um, there's a lot of spraying, for a commercial dessert apple orchard nowadays, you don't get many of those in Devon, but up country, a lot of them will be sprayed typically 15 times a year with fungicides and insecticides so that you can get perfect blemish free apples. So the meaning of, so the whole agricultural industry and the orchard industry has changed massively in the mainstream. And that's why I, one of the main reasons why the lovely old fashioned picturesque South Devon orchards languished and so many of them disappeared. But there was a whole different reason for the change um, for the loss of orchards. And that was a, the change in consumer tastes and our patterns of what we wanted to buy and what we wanted to drink. So I was one of those incredibly lucky people to be brought up in the early 70s when we were in love with food technology and uniformity and anything that was new and shiny. I remember having instant whip and smash instant mashed potatoes. I remember going to wimpy bars. It seems to me that the 1970s, my teenage years, were kind of all time low for taste, food and drink culture in this country. And that was the, 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 the big decline in um, demand for traditional orchard produce. We wanted apples from the supermarkets, which were all the same size and all totally blemish free. And I guess you can remember as well going into supermarkets or most shops in the 70s and 80s and all the only apples you could buy were Golden Delicious and Granny Smith's and Bramley's for cookers and not much else. So our changes, our tastes changed and what we wanted to drink changed as well. Um, yeah, I remember my teenage parties, we would have these big party seven tins of Watneys and Worthington. They were truly horrible. I don't know how we survived the experience, but we liked it at the time. And, um, but it also meant we were interested, the tastes changed and wanted an altogether lighter, more sophisticated drink. And um, so the very rough, old, still scrumpy ciders, which were the mainstay of what was produced here, fell out of fashion. People wanted things which were light and fizzy and less alcoholic. 
so that was another big, big change. The other, I suppose the third main reason I would give for the loss of our South Devon orchards was about what happened with the growth of villages and housing. So if we look at these, this map here, it's like the one I showed earlier, it's a different group of villages, but each of these villages um, had its own little nest, nestling cloak of orchards immediately around it, tucked into it. The villages were framed by orchards. And of course, what happened is when a lot of villages expanded and built out in the late 20th century, the place they were going to build out over was over the orchards. And that led to a lot of grubbing out of orchards in the name of housing development. And so if we just take an example of one village, this is Ipplepen. You can see, so that these are two maps, it's the same place, but two maps. On the left is the first um, series ordnance survey map around 1900-ish. And you can see there's a lot of orchards around Ipplepen then. And the one on the right is a later series ordnance survey map, really around just after the Second World War. It's not changed that much. There's still lots of orchards there. But the change happened later in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And the next slide will show Ipple Pen today. So if you can try and hold this picture in your mind, then we'll go on to the next one. And there we go. Ipple Pen is one of those villages which has expanded enormously. And the orchards have been built over effectively. And that means that sometimes the only way you would know that there were ever orchards there is from um, maps and street names. So here we are, like street names like Orchard Way or Old Orchard or Maddox Orchard are a clue to the fact that there was an orchard there once, but not any longer. So there's some of the reasons why we had such a big change and why um, by the late 1980s, late, late 1990s sort of time, this is what a lot of orchards might have looked like, just a sort of remnant tree here and there hanging on. But all was not lost, there was a revival. And so I'm going to talk about the revival um, of orchards and apple growing and cider making in South Devon. Um, so the big, the, the big thing that spurred the change or got things started was an organisation based in London called Common Ground, which was really interested in heritage and traditions. And in 1989, they started a national campaign across the country called us the Save Our Orchards campaign. And they were really keen to draw attention to the decline, the loss of our traditional orchard heritage. And they were looking for ways of rallying us all around a revival. And they started the idea of an annual um, Orchard Day, an Apple Day in October every year. So this happened nationally and started in 1989. And it so happened in South Devon that there were some people in the local authority countryside services who saw this national campaign and saw the possibility for South Devon. And they published an article in the new local newspaper um, in the 19, uh, early 1990s, asking if anybody was interested in this area in orchard restoration and revival. And they had a really strong response. So that led to the formation of the South Ham Save Our Orchards campaign, with a little leaflet there on the left. Um, so 
That campaign in the South Ham started in 1991. Um, and led to the formation of Orchard Link in 1998. And that, new, that uh, newsletter on the right is the first ever newsletter from Orchard Link. Um, and this was um, started a, a, a program of encouragement of apple and orchard restoration in South Devon. They set up a tree nursery, grafting and propagating local varieties. And they started running community apple days and running training courses. And it's been really steady progress and growth since then. So if we think about community orchards, which is one aspect, um, there's something like 30 to 40 community orchards in South Devon now, um, which are the focus for events, barbecues, wassails, children's activities, storytelling, all kinds of things like that. Um, Nikki and I worked together on um, a community orchards campaign funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund just a few years ago. And these are some of the activities in the picture here that um, took place as part of that community orchard project. It's been really fun. And um, on our Orchard Link website, which I'll tell you more about later, there's a list and map of all the community orchards in this area. And most of these are open to the public all the year round. So the community apple days run in this area still. This one is at Sharpham House at Ashbrington. They have an annual apple pressing day. And um, COVID restrictions permitting, they'll be having their Apple Day in early October, which is open to the public, and they get this big press going and make gallons and gallons of apple juice. It's well worth going to if you haven't been to one of these. If you, so one of the other things we do to help support community, orchard, well, all orchards and apple growing in South Devon is Orchard Link has got um, uh, some, um, some equipment, presses and mills and pasteurizers, which are available to hire to our members. So this is um, a screen grab from our website, the Orchard Link website, with one of the kits that you can hire for the day in the autumn if you've got an orchard. And there's all different sizes of equipment um, from small portable presses to great big things which need to go on a trailer and another intermediate size one in between. So this equipment is available and it's used really heavily throughout September and October and early November by orchard owners throughout South Devon. And this means that people who've got orchards can press their juice and do what I do, which is to bottle it and pasteurize it as apple juice. And I'm still drinking the pasteurized apple juice from our orchard, which we harvested last October. Uh, and quite a lot of people make their own cider as well. So one of the other things that was part of the orchard revival was training courses, because as more people started to plant apple trees and orchard trees, they needed to know how to look after them. So these pictures are of different training courses that we run uh, at Orchard Link, which anybody can join in with. Looking at things like pruning, um, scything, we do uh, courses on how to plan an orchard, how to manage an orchard for wildlife, all sorts of subjects like that. And we run those training courses throughout the year. And although we've been running them on Zoom during the lockdown, we're going to start running in-person courses for real uh, from June onwards, starting with um, a course on how to prune stone fruits. So that's like plums and cherries. Uh, in June or July, we're running a course. Um, yeah, so another really important aspect of the revival of orchards 
has been the tremendous uptake by commercial nurseries of um, propagating local varieties again. So uh, some really good nurseries in the area which specialize in producing really good numbers of local Devon varieties. Um, so Kingston Black there and Paint and Marigold, they're two very typical Devon varieties. And for years, you, nobody was propagating these. You couldn't buy them. Now you can. And not only, and, and you can also buy these in a range of different root stocks. So you can get the full size trees, which will grow enormous if you've got a big orchard. Or if you've got a little garden and you just want to grow a cordon or an espalier or a step over, and you want something on a dwarfing rootstock, then you can buy the same variety, but on a dwarfing rootstock. So, um, so there's a really good choice available. And it means that when we run some of our Orchard Link events, we can put on a display like this of the incredible variety of different, ap different apples um, grown in the area. These are all grown from different orchards um, in South Devon. Each of those apples is a different variety. And the specialist nurseries who do these things like places like Ensley Garden Nurseries over at, that's not Ensley Garden Centre at Ivy Bridge, Ensley Garden Nursery, which is different over at Milton Abbott near Tavistock, have a great range. Or there's Adam's Apples at Honiton. Or nearer to home at Dartington, there's the Schumacher College um, Nursery and the Agroforestry Research Trust at Dartington as well. They all sell a really good range of apples on different rootstocks. But a little tip, if you're planning on getting fruit trees for planting, get them early in the autumn season. If you wait till mm, February, March time, you may well find they've sold out of the varieties and sizes that you want. And of course, it's not just apples that we're talking about now. Um, there's a much bigger variety of fruit which you can buy. Local plums, for example, like the Dittisham Plowman or Dipsum Plowman Plum. And there's a good range of pears and cherries and mazards and damsons and bullaces and gauges and quinces and medlars and mulberries. There's a really good variety you can grow in your orchard now although some of them are much more fussy about their conditions. So, and then where are we with cider now? Well, I mentioned earlier about um, how cider making had got quite industrialized in some, uh, in some cases, and, and, and then sold out to big companies like Bulmers, and then moved off up country. And a lot of the large, commercial cider producers shut up shop in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. And, and typical of that would be the, the story of Inches Cider. So if you go into Sainsbury's today, you can buy a bottle of Inches Cider, which started off as a Devon um, farmer, a Devon farmer started it up at Winkley in 1916. Um, and all brewed on the site and then sent off all around the UK. That was um, bought out by Bulmers, who then promptly closed the Devon Brewery in, um, uh, in Winkley and moved it up to Herefordshire. And they were then taken over by Heineken. So you've got this extraordinary thing where your bottle of Inches Cider still kept the name, Inches Cider, which started off in Devon in 1916 is now still available at a pound a bottle, but it's, it's brew is grown in Herefordshire and it's owned by Heineken. So that's been the trend, but what that has done is opened up a gap in the market for new small craft cider makers in the locality. And this is really a really exciting development. So we've got things like um, companies like Heron Valley Cider at Loddiswell, Hunts Farm Cider at Paynton, Ashridge Cider at Staverton, Luscombe Cider at Buckfast Lee. 
Sam Cider at Winkley. So all these new craft ciders are set up as local businesses and they have capitalized on the resurgence of interest in local, good local drinks. And so my sense is that the, um, the future for Devon Orchards and Devon Cider is, is really bright at the moment. Just a final couple of slides. This is a bit in passing, although really it's, it, this is, could be the subject of a whole talk in its own right, really. Another reason why um, there's a resurgence of interest in Devon Orchards is because of their value for wildlife. Um, they tend to be very stable, long-term environments, which traditionally, and I don't mean the big commercial orchards up country, but traditionally didn't get sprayed um, or fertilized. And so they all act as mini nature reserves. Um, and, um, and they are a delight. They are real, uh, um, a real delight for wildlife. And owning and managing an orchard now is, brings great opportunities for, um, for wildlife. So in our little orchard here in South Brent, we've I found um, a grass snake basking in the sun on our wood pile, and we've had um, hedgehogs. Uh, we've had um, nuthatches nesting in the hollow apple trees. We I saw a deer in there once, maybe not quite so welcome because of their browsing damage, but all these things can be found in Devon orchards. So finally, um, I'll finish now by just saying that um, if any of what I've said about Orchard Link, the training courses or the equipment or the visits and events or anything like that interests you, then have a look on our website. You're welcome to join Orchard Link. It costs just £12 a year. Um, and there's a lot of resources on there as well. And we'd be pleased to see you. And I think, Nikki, that's my last slide. So I will stop there. Okay, if you just leave it there for